Good evening. My name is uh, Dr. Christopher Dusing, and I am here on August the 26th of 2024 with my reading group. And we are reviewing a couple pieces by Dr. Tumala Nara, PhD out of Boston College. Uh, the first is an article called Cultural Competence as a Core Emphasis of Psychoanalytic Psychotherapy. And we combined that with a video uh, by the same Dr. Tomala Nara engaging with racism and xenophobia in psychoanalytic psychotherapy. So we both had the text and a video component, and I'm really, really excited, blessed to be here as always. It's a privilege to be here. And as I said, I'm excited to see what comes of the conversation. Nicole, I'm going to hand it all over to you for a good enough overview of the article. Yeah, so I'll do a very, very broad, broad overview to get the ball rolling. But basically, this article kind of discusses the shortcomings in the psychoanalytic approach in terms of cultural competence. Um, and a main theme was that it just doesn't consider external forces on the internal life, which is such a heavy component of psychoanalysis. And obviously, some may experience the external forces of the world differently than others, um, depending on circumstances. And this can also affect the therapeutic process and outcomes. It discusses um, main things like historical trauma and oppression as kind of big ones there. Um, and just kind of discusses how it's an uncomfortable topic with a lot of clinicians sometimes because you can kind of feel like you're walking on eggshells. You don't want to say the wrong thing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the article also goes on to discuss assessment and testing and how there's a lack of inclusion of culturally um, specific interventions and assessments. Um, and they're also neglected in case studies as well, which we need to really amend there. Um, the idea of transference and counter-transference has come up um, in this article and also in a lot of our past discussions too. Um, another topic we had, um, a lot of times in the literature, it's really just between um, blacks and whites, but there are many other different groups that are involved and need to be recognized um, in these discussions. Um, the idea that attitudes and ideas about certain groups are sometimes mirrored in the therapeutic relationship. So kind of jumping back to transference and counter-transference. And again, we've talked about in the past how a lot of times people like view that as a complete no-no, but it can almost be used to your benefit in some situations. It's got to get a feel for what attitudes might be reflected onto you, vice versa. Um, the article discusses a lot of different approaches for kind of how to fix and fill in these gaps. Um, one of the approaches was self-examination. So you as the therapist kind of maybe like introspectively looking at your own attitudes, your own um, internal biases that you might have, um, stuff like that, just so you have like a really broad sense of self-awareness going into treating. Um, another big one was language and affect. Um, and one of the things that stuck out stood out to me in this section was um, the different interpretations of silence, because if you've sat in on any of Dr. D's shadows a lot, there, there are moments of silence and those really do facilitate the client to, to say really meaningful things a lot. Um, but culturally, this can be interpreted very differently by different groups of people. So it's important to keep that in mind too, because you have good intentions while doing it, but the client might receive that in a completely different way. Um, another one we had social oppression and affecting the view of the client's self and others and how that kind of um, presents itself in the therapeutic process. And then the last big approach was um, intersecting cultural identities and their negotiation. I loved the case study um, that the author had brought up, brought up about um, the Indian woman and her kind of mixed feelings about her culture with arranged marriage. And um, the therapist might have a thought on how she should be feeling about this, but has to also consider um, the woman's culture and her own family beliefs about that and how she feels about them individually. Um, and then just like the main takeaway was really just the need for integration across disciplines and frameworks to really fill in these gaps. And that's my overview to get the ball rolling. Beautifully done. Um, 
I think a lot of uh, this can be boiled down. Uh, if people know me, I really like to try and simplify this stuff. Um, assumptions make an ass out of me and you, right? It's um, If we're assuming a lot of this stuff comes out of assumptions and um, unconscious bias, I, I want to give um, some outlines of what I saw in the video. Uh, I really like what Dr. Tomala Nara does in terms of couching this uh, in terms of couching cultural competence and cultural uh, development as a maturation process, uh, as kind of a developmental process. I had not thought of that before. And uh, she also talks about depositing, um, how children of, of immigrants or other cultures uh, oftentimes um, have to, they get deposited, they get these uh, biases deposited within them, and that can go unmentalized um, if, if we're not, if we don't bring that to consciousness, and that can really affect things, uh, both in the minority and the ma majority culture. Uh, she also highlighted um, oftentimes the first generation from another country and the second generation are very, very different. Uh, we tend to look at it as monolithic and the acculturation gap that occurs from that, where the first um, wave of immigrants are here to survive uh, versus the second uh, generation, which has the pressure to thrive. And this can really uh, result in a split. And the intergenerational transmission of racism, of xenophobia, I really hadn't thought of that in terms of the intergenerational um, transmission of it. I immediately just associate that with traditional trauma. Um, and also highlighting, at least in the United States, we are in some pretty, uh, what's the right word? <laughs> Many words could apply. Uh, some some dark and confused times here. And Dr. Tomla Nara did a great job of um, highlighting the rise of Trumpism and over the past eight years, uh, how the divide perhaps uh, between different cultures has uh, really widened and also the ability of people to speak up and speak anonymously uh, in terms of discrimination, uh, racial slurs and things like that has become a much more acceptable thing. In terms of this depositing thing too, I'll circle back. This is my thought. I think depositing can occur on so, uh, so much more of an intense level with the internet and technology. Uh, we can get deposited with misinformation or disinformation. And if that lines up with the messages that we're getting from our parental or our or authority uh, figures, uh, then we can see how that can become identity that can really calcify into identity. So uh, I loved I love the article. It goes uh, it goes deep. It goes to an uncomfortable space and uh, made me take a look at myself and reminded myself of my MSW studies, too. I had to take a year of uh, racism, American racism classes. And one of the first things the instructor said is we're all racist. Well, thank you so much, Nicole and Dr. Dustin, for opening up such amazing discussion. I have enjoyed the audio and the article, and, you know, I have this background in anthropology, so I have some experience of talking about these things, but never any experience is enough to be fully comfortable, because we do tend to assume about others things that they may not actually uphold and I found that uh, to be the case for me even with people from my um, region for example right uh, when I'm assuming that uh, somebody who grew up in Russia is Russian but they identify themselves as a Russian American for example or they uh, in fact have the family from Kazakhstan uh, which is a completely different thing right they have the indigenous uh, roots, for instance, right? So I thought that um, there were many things that were worth mentioning, but, but going off of what you said, Dr. Dusing, in connection to what Dr. Usha Tamala Nara uh, video uh, about racism and xenophobia, she, she made great point, I think, about um, how uh, for us, uh, xenophobia encountering the other is somehow connected to our primary attachment figures. When we begin identifying 
people who are ours versus those who are not ours, uh, and how this can be so deep that we can actually not perceive the members of these other groups, whether it's based, based on race or ethnicity or some other characteristics as somebody who are like us, like we virtually stripping them of uh, humanity, we're dehumanizing them. And that's of course very prominent right now in my communities, which are Russian, and also partially Ukrainian, because there is a lot of dehumanization going on in connection to the war, a complex ongoing trauma of wars unfolding, is that how I perceive it? And I think uh, it is totally mind blowing how people can actually strip of humanity the members of the group of others um, based on the ethnicity and citizenship something that is completely uh, contrary to all the expectations and all our knowledge when we are not sympathizing, for example, with the suffering of the children of other group, just because this is the other group's children and we are actually taking joy. You know, a lot of people online express a lot of joy at the suffering of the others. It is as if we do not share the humanity. So, so I thought it was profound. But returning to what you said, Dr. Dusing, about the differences of the generations, like between the generations of the first and second generation, how big that can be. Again, I'm observing it on my own, you know, experience with seeing uh, the children of the generations of the immigrants who are becoming suddenly much more into the culture that they associate to be their own. For example, the parents would never wear traditional clothes, you know, in their own country. But after they immigrated, the children begin wearing these clothes, like associating themselves with this culture. So that's, that's a fascinating issue. I mean, um, I, I can continue, but I'll uh, stop here. Just wanted to say thank you for bringing that up. I think we should talk about it. Um, if I could say something. Um, so when reading the article about the female immigrant client and how like the therapist has like a different upbringing than her, I feel like a way to not make assumptions or stereotypes is better to like have like a comprehensive like background on the client. So instead of like misinterpreting what how she's feeling um just like so she could have a more of her understanding of like a better cultural background i think that's what we really need in the practice right now because we need more diverse um therapists i think that also brings more of like a better discussion um with the people that you know have similar cultural um backgrounds to the therapist, it might be easier for them to understand one another. I think that's very important. If I could just add on to what Hannah said and Dr. Dusing said this as well, is just to make sure that you're not assuming anything about a client and always asking, um, oh, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Or what's your perspective of this? Um, something that came up for me in this article was like an individualist versus a collectivist culture might um, perceive things differently, especially in talk therapy. Um, our westernized version of talk therapy, we focus a lot on the client and what their internal feelings are about themselves. Um, but this could be like a super uncomfortable thing for some people because they've grown up thinking about the we and not the I. Um, so making sure that you're always asking questions, clarifying and never assuming because um, at the end of the day, we want our clients to feel comfortable and building that therapeutic relationship is always like one of the number one things. I wanted to pick up on that because when you're saying, and it struck a chord on me, and I'll just follow the flow of what my head did and do my best to repeat. So what you had said, Taylor, was that 
you know, we have to really work hard at not making assumptions. And I thought back to my younger self, I'm 60. So I thought back to my younger self and, and how I grew up in this ultimate paradox. I have to put that part in where I made a choice very clearly between my grandfather, who was very kind and was not bigoted and was himself indigenous and European, and my grandmother, who was the worst bigot and also very mean to me. So I made, I, it was one of those things where I'm never going to do that. And I got to a certain point as a therapist and a person, a community developer, and it was exhausting. The, and, and the thing is, I'm convinced now that I just allow myself to make the mistakes. And sometimes, yes, I'm human. I've made an assumption. Let's work through it because I am less likely to get the counter transferences and the feedbacks as now they're reacting to my super performance of perfection that nobody can, right? And so it just became worse. So I don't do that anymore. Um, but I think what it brings home is the what most struck me and hence a little story about myself but certainly not to overshadow the um the presenters i'm not really good at names is the richness and i always think of Aslina as a cultural ethnographer whenever i'm reading all these great readings and how much rich ethnographic and detailed personal story and narrative there is that comes out and in terms of her own stories, as well as the contrasting stories that she gave about the different uh, experiences that she used to accentuate the different points of how different people process being in different permutations and combinations of the diversities and the contextualizing in place of diversity and so on. And it then poured it over into the article which I li listened to second so I had listened to hers first and she then did such an excellent job and I've written in this area and it was just so much better than me and it was just such an excellent job of speaking to the issues and really drawing those parallels and in her speaking, as in her writing, it's this is what it is, listen, before we kill each other, right? It just was so clear without the emotionalism that, that sometimes can creep in. It certainly does when I get into it. So thank you for sharing the article. I did want to highlight the, the perfectionism uh, on page uh, 277. So uh, culturally competent therapists aim to engage with several tasks, uh, develop your self-awareness, develop general knowledge about multicultural issues and the impact of various cultural group membership on clients, develop a sense of multicultural self-efficacy or the therapist's sense of confidence in delivering culturally competent care, understand unique cultural factors, develop an effective counseling working alliance in which mutuality and collaboration are emphasized. And lastly, like that's not enough, right? Um, develop intervention skills in working with culturally diverse clients. I just wanted to highlight, that's a lot to ask of a therapist. So I think that words like culturally sensitive, it used to be cultural sensitivity, like cultural sensitivity training. I was curious about that shift too. Like when did that shift to cultural competence? Because uh, as um, the article states, that denotes a, a degree of technical proficiency, right? You're either competent or you're incompetent. I found myself uh, switching out competence with curiosity or culturally curious. And for me, as a practicing therapist, I need something that allows me some margin and the ability to forgive myself for my blind spots, my biases, um, and the disconnections that that is going to create in, in the therapy room. So, so all I'm saying, it's a lot to ask of a therapist. Uh, seems like an impossible assignment, but one I'm up to. I'm going to draw that out, Chris, because what you just said really struck a chord. As I've mentioned before, I'm a multicultural counselor with the telehealth work that I do. And you know what? I've discovered because I, I'm an ethnographer and phenomenologist. I learned from my clients. And, and like you just said, we also have, um, as clinicians, responsibilities. And sometimes there's parts of culture and educated clients will tell you there are parts of my culture that are my problem, right? 
And if we can't make that safely as an assumption that maybe part of culture or system is part of the problem. And I believe that that's what was being, you know, she talked about Erickson, she talked about from, right? It, it's not like the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, right? I mean, if this, then that, right? And so, yeah, no, I think that's just a beautiful thing to say. Um, I also like what you said, Brenda, I'm going back to Erickson on 276. So, you know, if you haven't heard of these names, Eric Fromm, Karen Horne, Harry Stack Sullivan, um, just brilliant, and Eric Erickson. Uh, so they argued that development is shaped by contextual issues that vary across cultures and time periods. And so we can become aware of these things. However, it says later that the new frameworks that emerged recognize that psychotherapy uh, which decontextualize, apoliticize, and ahistoricize development may actually contribute to internalized oppression and a compromised sense of agency. It just makes me think that how this th therapy, um, like traditional therapy frameworks, uh, can almost de decimate uh, the, these nuances, right? And decontextualize, dehumanize. We talked about dehumanization. And also some of these frameworks stay in place because the cult, the dominant culture needs them to, uh, the capitalistic culture needs them to. Um, so the theory and the intent to change may be there and there may be greater forces at work that inhibit change and shifts. Yeah, that is, that is absolutely fascinating. I think that moment that is uh, very important here uh, in the article, in the early part of the 20th century in the United States, the mental hygiene movement and uh, World War I contributed to a medicalization of psychoanalytic theory and practice, further situating the locus of pathology and health within the individual. So that is like the individual becomes somebody who is responsible, the sole sufferer of his or her condition is also responsible for taking care of themselves. The onus of uh, uh, sort of uh, responsibility, I guess, for all the actions, for all the experiences that are shut back onto the individual. And uh, I think that's where all the system of oppressions, all the various systems of racial discriminations and so on and so on, they just fall through. They are not in the picture. And the Freudian entire idea, I guess, of this uh, individual that contains the world and has ego and has uh, subconscious and has all the structures as, as the structure that, that can be imposed upon all other people of other different cultures, and it became dominant in psychoanalysis. I think that is something that prompts this movement of multiculturalism in counseling and so on. But I'm also here to say that at least in the contemporary master's programs, they do have, at least in my program, we do have a, a whole bunch of, you know, chapters and the course about multicultural competencies nowadays and, and but as an anthropologist reading them i find that some of these things that are presented as competences i know they will be criticized by my classmates in my phd program for being way too flattening way too grounded in some stereotyping you know this whole idea that oh asians behave in this way and these cultures are collectivist, and therefore they are not like us, individualist countries, uh, cultures. I should say that some of this cultural talk uh, may feel very alienating and othering to people. You know, uh, for example, in the video, uh, the therapist was saying that she would ask her client to talk to her about the ethnicity and that is totally reasonable makes a lot of sense uh, i'm confident she's doing it in the most harmonious way in the most healing way possible but i also know that if i was asked in the first 
counseling session as a client, what my ethnicity is, uh, that would feel very othering to me because I might even not want to bring that up. You know, some people may assume that, oh, well, I'm Americanized enough at this point to even not talk about it. Uh, that would feel to me a little like, you know, buying stuff somewhere and people would ask, oh, and where is this accent coming from? And it's like, you're not there to talk about the story of your life. You're just there to buy stuff and go go on with the, with the day, you know, so... I don't know what what to kind of offer. I guess there is a tension there. I think that's a really good point. And um, last semester, two semesters ago, I took my multicultural competency course um, in my master's work. And something that was really highlighted for us was the therapeutic alliance and building that trust because these are really difficult and awkward sometimes conversations to have and that relationship and openness and honesty between the clinician and the client kind of allows for those conversations to go more smoothly and allows for apologies or um, clarifications to be asked for in a way that isn't going to hopefully make anyone uncomfortable and if that uncomfortableness does arise being able to broach that topic and be like, I am a human and I really want to learn more about this in a way that, um, that I can try to not let this happen again. Um, yeah, so I think that the therapeutic relationship, I know I already said that in broaching topics like this is like a really, really important thing to emphasize. Yeah, I mean, some of these cultural um, issues, they can seem very exotic to somebody who is out of this culture. For instance, even this example with the arranged marriages, it may seem very foreign to many of us. However, the thing is, uh, you know, I know somebody who is in an arranged marriage and it works somehow. It turned out to be a very beautiful and productive marriage from the look of it, you know, so it's, it, there is a lot of points of contentions of this uh, 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 sort. But I think one other point that the article is making that is very interesting is the potential convergence and divergence of the aspects of minority and uh, majority within the same identity because uh, it's very easy for us to know where we are a minority because we get reminded about it all the time by others but we take for granted very often the aspects of our identity that are majority uh, related let's say for example we are heterosexual so that's what we are taking for granted and then it becomes you know um, sort of something that uh, I know in Russian culture for example you know it's not something that Americans would say right now but uh, publicly at least but I know there are sentiments like oh why just why can't they just do all that but like hiding while hiding or something like that right so there is a lot of uh, st stigmatization and pathologization of these relationships and we do not even notice how much of a um, majority aspects of our personality how much they are uh, accepted by society and how comfortable we are with them but as soon as you are a minority in some aspect, you will notice and you will be able to speak about oppression and everything like that. And for some people, there is a lot of aspects of minority identity that come together and they do intersect. I think uh, Spivak was calling it the different axis of oppression. I think there's a lot about the fear of the unknown. Like we're scared to talk about things that we don't like really understand fully 
And when we have clients that are of different cultures than us, we get like, you know, intimidated to talk about it because we don't want to say the wrong things. But at the same time, we're, we're afraid to ask questions because we think that some of the questions might be offensive. I think what comes to me the most is if you're going to work with people from all different types of backgrounds, if something becomes either strange or weird to you or unknown, to me that just screams a lack of understanding, which means a lack of knowledge. And with cultures um, over here in England and Leicester, we're, we have a lot of people from all over the world from here. And I do talk a lot to other people because I absolutely love to hear the backgrounds and different lives and you know where they've come from um so for me it's intriguing and I've completely forgotten where I was going with this if I'm completely honest um yeah most of the culture and unknown goes down to history I've noticed like the history of the religion where it's come from why did why are arranged marriages arranged you know it's it's an understanding and cultures very very closely linked to history and I think if we understand the history we may be understanding the culture which then can help us with the clients but that's that's my perspective. So if I find something strange, straight the way it's because I don't know enough about it. Lena or, or Dr. Orlova, excuse me. Um, I wanted to touch on the example uh, that you made me think of in the article where um, there's an Asian football player and he's, or it might be in the talk actually, um, the Asian football player, his white uh teammate says you know what I, I i like you uh because you don't talk about racism so just think about that silencing in terms of um i see you for who you are um and as long as you don't talk about it uh we're okay we're good so just uh kind of mind-blowing with that example yeah i think it's extremely important to for us all especially for those of us who are white people uh, to become increasingly more comfortable with being uncomfortable, you know, because we need to talk about this stuff and we need to make these mistakes and we are going to be called out on them. And I agree with that example you brought previously, Dr. Ducing, about one of your mentors, I think, saying to you, to you and, and everybody that we are racist. Yes, absolutely, we are, because these are um, very deeply culturally ingrained patterns. Nobody is immune from them. We don't have to spend our energy on denying that racism is something we also uphold. We need to spend our energy try trying to understand how we can undo some of that. What I wanted to pick up on was um, what you were saying, Lena, about we have to, everyone can be discomforted. I'm very familiar with discomfort, but it, as a person where I sit, this has been, you know, I don't need to be an academic for this kind of stuff to be on my mind. It's been my life, my whole life. So, um, but the other thing that's been my life for a really long time, 42 years exactly, is evaluation and doing work as a methodologist. And even longer, because I was nine when I started in services. So for 51 years, I've learned how to reformulate and str strategize and document. And in the, what I feel very strongly, and I have for a very long time, is that it's that word perfection. And this addiction that seems to come up for people around perfection and that admitting an error, either of a mission or commission, means admitting to imperfection. 
that means I'm going to get in trouble. So once again, and I think it just brings right back that, you know, Eric Fromm and Derek Erickson and et cetera, they got it right, right? Because it all goes back to development and those relational behaviors that we learn. And that's where we need to focus the change, right? Is the social, emo I feel we should have couple training in preschool everything we learn and we don't get to start until we're in university unless we get sent to services yay right it should just be part of it. not an add-on health class yawn right it need and it needs to be modeled i was thinking about this today because there's an experience that I'm involved in that's rather large and I was thinking back to when 16 years ago it all started and you see the criticism now is that because I well quite frankly was professional in environments instead of being the big boss who's got all lippy with people well I disadvantaged myself in a certain environment where if you do that but I've been able to say recently is that you know what 16 years later, being a professional and modeling professionalism in that environment is now passed as the new ideal to address the seriously compromised culture in this particular organizational context. And that's what most comes through here is that we've got a lot of work to do in a lot of contexts to take the fear off of us that if we make the slightest mistake, you know what, ask anybody I work for, how often I send them, guess what, <laughs> you might get a complaint, <laughs> right? Why would I not want them to know? Why would I want this to be a surprise and it's usually really little shit right I'm really just manipulating them for the big ones right? but the thing is is I never get in trouble right we just now we know or I'm giving them a heads up right that, that this is prickly and maybe someone should have caught this in triage right because I don't want the fires to start. We've got fires up here that come and threaten to burn our houses down, right? So I don't want to start fires. And I think that what we all need, I think, to talk about at some point, um, Dr. Dusing, is that something that can, you know what she said, advocacy also, right? And this is maybe what's coming out naturally is that she said for too long, psychoanalysis and science has said advocacy has nothing to do with it. Well, I was raised by those tutored by Charles Wright Mills and Paul Lossarsfeld and I say wrong, <laughs> wrong. We have to make advocacy part of what we do because like I said, some people actually have to live on the streets. They live rough and they don't have anything and they're really smart when you get to talk to them and if you heard their life stories as most people haven't then we would make changes in this whole litigiousness and um fear of eggshells that we end up wading through because we're all afraid of getting in trouble because that would mean we're bad kids or something I'm a bad kid. Admit it. <laughs> Thanks. Me too. Um, just a time check. We're about eight minutes. Uh, there's a couple things. Oh, Victoria, I'm forgetting them. Oh, the Olympics. Right. So um, in the United States, it's really interesting to experience the Olympics. Um, all you hear is USA, 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 the medal count. And also hear a lot of people, and also in the political environment, and this will ruffle people's feathers, and I'm totally aware of it. Um, people will always say in America, we are the greatest country in the world. Um, I really think that we need to back away from that hierarchical standpoint, because first off, that's ridiculous. Um, it's like to assume we're the greatest country because we have the most medals and we have the greatest military and we're the largest, blah, blah, blah. 
Uh, I think a more nuanced view would be, uh, in some ways, America is the best country in the world and the worst country in the world. In some ways, France, especially with food, uh, is the best country in the world and <laughs> Has, has so we need to look in terms of different cultures, not in terms of good or bad or best or worst. And uh, I think as Americans, maybe take a little ego out of it. Maybe we don't need to chant USA, USA so much. Um, I don't see other countries, and I was struck by this. I don't see other countries chanting their name, and I'm like, what is that about? Um, I had another thought, but it got lost in in my Olympics uh, rant there. When we say like USA, USA, it gives us more or less a fixed mindset. Like we can't grow over time. Like we should be able to say like, oh, we could work on this and that and all the things. But if we constantly say, well, we're the best, like, you know, we're not the best. Like that means we can't improve, basically. Oh, I remember now. Um. So, of course, I'm going to come to the defense of psychoanalysis and psychodynamicism here. Um, DBT applies here. Uh, DBT uh, is pretty much an acultural um, treatment. It's pretty much a, a protocolized, manualized treatment. And in some of the DBT groups that I've run, uh, in particular, um, yeah, more diverse groups uh, in terms of uh, race, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of sexuality, uh, there's been criticisms of DBT in terms of uh, this feels like, I, I had a client say, this feels like an old white woman's therapy, Dr. Marsha Lenahan, who I adore. And uh, there's very, very big blind spots there. So with ego psychology, psychoanalysis, DBT, CBT, ACT, EFIT, um, REBT, uh, all those alphabet soups. Let's realize uh, that we all have to do work with this cultural competence. It's not just psychoanalysis. So I want to broaden it out from this article because uh, this can feed into the uh, usual discourse that um, psychoanal it's all psychoanalysis' fault, <laughs> right? Whereas this paper really provides some meat in terms of relational psychoanalysis, intersubjectivity theory. Um, it provides us with... Uh, a roadmap uh, to address these things. The one thing I will say is what seems to me the most integratable movement, at least with the least amount of change for cultural competence would be existential humanistic psychology. I'd be curious to see, um, go into the stacks and see what readings there are on that. Yeah, that would really be interesting to see what different uh, modalities in therapy do with uh, multicultural approach. For me, for example, solution-focused brief therapy will work for everybody. Well, that's how I feel about it. Uh, but yeah, you're absolutely right. It's a great point that it's not just psychoanalysis. Always have to come to the defense of psychoanalysis because not enough people are defending it. Um, Lastly, on a on a personal note, I'll just say this made me think a lot of my um, mother. Uh, you know, my mother came from the Philippines. Uh, she was an illegal. Uh, back in those days, or actually, this is another term that's coming up in America that's disturbing me. On uh, a lot of the political rhetoric is illegal aliens. Like, just think about that. That, that, that just. But my mom was an illegal, and you know, she came to this country, and it's really interesting to think of myself as kind of the second removed, and to think of the stripping of all the Filipino culture that has occurred from me. I like to tell people I'm pretty much the whitest half Filipino you'll meet. I don't speak Tagalog. I do love Filipino food, but I'm not connected uh, with my culture. And that makes me incredibly sad. So I would hope that with greater cultural competence in our, in our therapeutic modalities, uh, we can preserve uh, culture and not necessarily have, uh, and I'm speaking from America, have this kind of be a melting pot where culture is stripped away where we can be intensely curious about it and perhaps and revitalize it and um, uh, rejuvenate it um, through 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 elements like psychoanalysis. 
Dr. Dusing, I'll jump on that. And thank you for disclosing your personal story. But as I've said, I'm a multicultural counselor <clears throat> and I have seven stories that came into my head that said, wow, do we ever need a resource for people like you? Because it's actually true. There's a lot of that going around and it's a rather specialized, you know, you can work around the edges, but it would be useful to have a specialized skill uh, it, specific to the Filipino, you know, context. That's what I feel. All right. Any mic drops before we close out? This is uh, just uh, such an honor and pleasure. I really appreciate the new voices in here with Taylor and Hannah. I hope you'll continue to join us. All right. Well, thank you, everyone.